This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. This morning we're going to pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about the gifts of God, and specifically the gift of time. So turn if we, if, I'll get it out. Turn with me, if you would, in your Bibles this morning to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. We'll read a, a portion here, then I will review um, kind of where we were, because it's been a few weeks since we touched this ground, um, and we will dive in here this morning. Um, but Ecclesiastes chapter 3, we'll read the first 10 verses here as we consider uh, this aspect of time as a gift of God, something God has given us. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth. I have seen the travail which God hath given the sons of men to be exercised in it. Verse 11 here. And he hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their hearts so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word here this morning. And as we consider here briefly just this aspect of time as a gift that you've given us, and as we look at this passage in Ecclesiastes and a few other passages this morning, we ask that you would give us a sense of appreciation for the time you have given us, the gift of time. We ask that you would guard my mouth, give me clarity in my mind, Give us clarity of thoughts, even for those who listen. That the distractions of the, the holiday and the previous days and, and the good things we've enjoyed uh, may not cloud our thinking, but may your spirit at this point be free to speak to us from your word. Open our hearts and minds to truth. And we ask this in your son's name. Amen. So in this short little series or mini-series on time as a gift of God, we talked first of all how the Lord himself... He's Lord of time. God controls time from beginning to end. We don't control when we're born. We don't control when we die. Um, he is the God. He's, he's established time. He's also set the patterns of time. So the week, the, the months, the years um, in that we celebrate. And even though on a calendar, there's you know, differences of calendar. Almost all calendars have 12 months. And God has set the patterns of time. So God is the Lord of time. Also, time is a gift of God. We looked at James where he says every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from the Father of lights. And we recognize that when we think that we own time and it's our time, then when someone infringes upon our time, 
we get upset. When we had plans to do X, Y, Z, and then someone shows up and needs something or gives us a call and we're not in the mood right then, we feel violated. But that time was never ours to begin with. Moving into point three for this service here, or sermon, time is the fabric of the seasons. Here in our passage we just read, Ecclesiastes 3, verses 1 to 10, uh, Solomon in this book, Ecclesiastes, is, the title itself simply means the preacher. And Solomon is here recounting wisdom, as it were, and, and we could go along. Uh, Ecclesiastes is, is one of my favorite books of the Bible, especially the Old Testament. But he's, he's highlighting this aspect of time in our lives. And he's going to get to a point where he, he, in the book he tells you that, you know, everybody dies at some point in time. I mean, it doesn't matter how good you are in life and bad, whatever, everybody dies. But in this section here, he's covering this element of there's time to do all these different things. You know, there, there's a right season and time to you know, be born and die. You don't get to choose those, but they happen once in your life. There's a time to plant and a time to pluck that which is planted. Boy, don't those go hand in hand? You don't put out the equipment for harvesting in the spring. That's not what you're going to do. You plant in the spring and you harvest in the fall. There's times to do different things. He has a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. And I don't know that I need to go through all of this here with us this morning, because I think you get the idea. We are complicated beings. God made us complicated, and he made the seasons complicated. Not needlessly, ridiculously complicated, but aren't you kind of glad that we have four seasons in a year? Could you imagine if all year long was like summer? Now, there's parts of the world that have not quite four seasons, but two seasons. They have the rainy season and the dry season. And, and I understand that I, I don't want to speak so localized that, you know, we, have, we enjoy, if you want to say enjoy, four seasons, right? Summer, winter, fall, spring. We get all those seasons in a year. They're all different. We enjoy the changes of colors in the fall. You enjoy the look of the snow, but not the shoveling or the cold. Okay, I, I understand that. But it's part of the rhythm of life. That there's these seasons and times at which we do various things. Uh, even as Solomon goes through this list, you know, casting away stones, gathering stones. I don't know what he has driving out there. My mind goes to in warfare, they would often tear down buildings and scatter the stones. Um, but in times of peace, they would gather them up to, to build structures. Um, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. You know, just all these different elements they're part of life, and everything has a time. One of the things that's so difficult to teach children is what's appropriate to do in a certain time. Do, do you know what I'm talking about? It may not be wrong for them to play, and it may be good and healthy for them to play, but sometimes when they choose to play and be loud and rambunctious, it's not the right time. Right? They don't recognize what's happening around them, or they're distracting from other things happening. Or there's a time to work. We're living in a society now that doesn't like the idea of work as a whole. And so, you know, they'd rather not work. And if the government will pay you not to work, then all better to them. And, well, there's a time for work. But for some of us, we work, work, work. We don't take that time of rest. Six days show you labor and do all thy work, and on the seventh, you rest. So, so there's time for these different elements of life. Also here, what doth it profit? Verse 9, he that worketh in, the, in wherein he laboreth. I've seen the travail which God hath given the sons of men to be exercised in it. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. These different elements Solomon has pointed at and brought us to, he's closing out this little section here, reminding who stitches together and brings together all the aspects of time. It's God. You see, what point is it to plant your field? We, we, can, we can visualize this. You plant your field. You prepare for the harvest. But what point is it if hail is going to wipe out the crop? What point is it if we, we haven't seen this 
in our country for years or, or what, if ever, but like a plague of locusts come through and take it all out. What point is it if, if the crop gets diseased? But do you know any of that when you're planting? You don't. Oh, sure, we, we like to, as a modern man, we like to have all these predictions and figure out what things will do and, and what they won't do, but there's no way we can predict everything. And so we do the best we can with what we have, but who do we ultimately have to rest in? Because it's God who makes all things beautiful in his time. Beautiful phrase here that ties into what we talked about in Sunday school a few weeks ago. He has set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from beginning to end. God's working in the background. God's working behind the scenes. We think of books like the book of Esther, where God is not mentioned at all, and yet you see him, his hand at work. We have other books of the Bible where God is, like Ruth, where he's not really mentioned that much, but oh, it's clear he is at work. And in your life and mine, God is at work behind the scenes. But we have these individual moments of time Summer times to plant, summer times to harvest, summer times to water. And we can go to different analogies here. As I was reading and studying on this, <clears throat> I had something I thought was helpful to think about. And the more I thought about it, the more I could tear it apart. So I'm not going to press it too hard. But one author and preacher was talking about what's the difference between time and seasons. You ever thought about that? Or is there a difference? And I'm not sure if this fits really well, but time is more of a moment. It's a, it's, it's a moment by moment thing. So for instance, we usually, when we talk about time, we, we usually use it in the sense of the plural, or, or not uh, in this. So I went to the store three times today, right? I'm referring to three different events that I went to the store, right? But if I refer to a season, I'll say, you know, fall. You know, fall, it's all one season. And I think this is helpful for us as we think about time. Because, for instance, if, it's like if you zoom in on a photo. Does anybody have any idea what that is? Other than a hexagon. It does look like a hexagon. But could you tell me what that object is? Andrew? It is an ornament. How would you know? You don't know. It is. It's part of a larger picture. Is it not? This little bit here is part of a bigger picture. One has been on the screen many times already. The point to be made here, if, if we think of time as the individual events, the moments, that if we try to measure it, you know, we measure it down to the second or the minute. But let's be honest, sometimes we can't even... How long is it going to take you to do this? I don't know, three to five minutes. I'm doing this now, right? And now is the moment in time I'm living it. But what you do with a moment in time will either help or hinder the larger picture of the season. If you waste your time now, you leave a gap for later. It's not completed. I don't know if you've ever, um, I, I deal with, with electronics a lot. And then when a pixel goes bad on a screen, just one pixel, and to give it in perspective, you're talking several thousand pixels each way, maybe a million or a couple million pixels per image with modern devices. But when one pixel goes bad and it turns green, you can see that easily. You know it easily. Andrew's computer at the house, he's got an old monitor, and it has one line of pixels that's off. And so... You can get most of the picture, but there's one line that sticks out like a sore thumb. Why? Because that line is not functioning properly. All the pixels lined up there don't look right. And you don't have to be a computer genius or anything to figure it out. You know something is wrong there. Now, with you and me, here in Ecclesiastes, there's all these different elements of time for us. And all can be made good in God's timing. But we need to follow the Lord in his leading and live our lives as best as we can to redeem the time. Which is why this is important and why 
it's important that we take those moments of time into the seasons of time that we have and we redeem the time. Several verses here we'll look to, and I'll, I'll put them on the screen. You can turn there if you like. In Psalm 90, verse 12, we read, So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. It's an interesting concept to stop and think about here, because I've already established through the series that we don't really know when we die. You don't know that you're going to have until this many years when, when you're going to pass away. You don't know what the end is. So it's hard sometimes to number our days, is it not? Because we don't know the end. But we can live in such a way that we think, okay, the average person lives to be 80, maybe 90. Some of you are older than that. Some of you, we have this much life. What are we going to do with it? How will we serve God with it? The psalmist here isn't just number your days so you get the most pleasure out of life. It's teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Much of the things we accomplish and do in life don't happen in one sitting. They don't happen in one day or even a week. Much of the things that we accomplish in life happen day by day. We were talking this morning in Sunday school about reading the Bible and different ways to read it and different reading plans and, and the benefits of some of those but what you do on a day-to-day -day basis matters. It really does. In the time, the moment, maybe a better term, you're in, what are you going to do with it? Do you have a habit of daily spending time with God and his word? Daily trying to grow in, in grace? Daily trying to hear from the Lord and praying with him? Do you daily do that? And in doing that day by day, it creates a greater, larger picture, and you grow over years of development. Sometimes it's discouraging, much like those. This is the new year. A lot of people will start diets, and they'll get on the scale, and they're looking at the scale, and they're watching their weight go down, and then they, you know, they have a New Year's party, or they have a, something happens, and their weight goes back up. Okay? Well, it's not the individual days that matter as much as the consistency. The pattern of investing your time in a way that honors and pleases the Lord, a way that draws you closer to him so you can apply your hearts to know him more and it changes you as a person. So we don't know how many days we have, but we can ballpark as it were and try to use what we have of our life to God's glory. Colossians 4-5 to says, Walk in wisdom toward them that are without redeeming the time. Now, I find this interesting, this idea of buying back or redeeming time. All of us have the same amount of time per day. I don't know how much time your life will allow as a whole. I don't know, know all that. I don't know my life. But I do know that each of us today have 24 hours. And what we do with those hours or those minutes of time that we have some control over. Not complete control, but we have some control over. And this idea we're to redeem or buy back the time, we're to make the most of the time. To the Colossians, Paul writes here, walk in wisdom towards them which are without. What we do with our time matters because it should impact those outside of the, this church wall. It should impact those outside the body of Christ. Because we want to not just redeem the time, we want to draw them and redeem them into a relationship with the Lord. Ephesians 5 is very similar language, but slightly different, also from Paul. Paul says, see that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but all three of these verses have had connections to the idea of wisdom. A wise person redeems the time. And this isn't necessarily wise in a human earthly sense. Okay? Wise people who are not Christians, okay? people who are efficient as it were, they make the most of their time. A secular businessman 
he really wants his employees to make the most of their time. He doesn't want to be paying them to play around on a computer. He doesn't want to pay them to sit around and, and just chat about the news. He's paying them to work. He wants them to be wise stewards and work well with their time. So I don't think the wisdom we're dealing with here is simply on the level that the secular is at where we want to make the most of, of time. We want to get the, you know, squeeze the most profit out of those minutes that we have. But there's a wisdom in walking godly. You see, Proverbs connects wisdom to the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And so wisdom isn't just simply living such a way in life so you have a good life. Wisdom is living in such a way in life that you are lining yourself up with God and what he says in his word, and you are living that out because this life is not the end. This life is simply the beginning for eternity with the Lord. Back to Ephesians 5 here, it says, see that you walk circumspectly. That's kind of a big word and a funny word, and I don't think anybody used it this week. But I think the best way that I've ever heard this word pictured, and you all know exactly what I mean, is when you're walking through a cow pasture, you walk circumspectly. Why? Because there's all sorts of pies out there that you don't want to step in. Now, maybe you're the type that you don't care because you got boots and you're going to wash them up anyway. Okay, fine, I get it. But for the most of us, you walk through a pasture, you walk circumspectly because you don't want to step in it. Now, this is how we approach the use of our time. Walk circumspectly. He says, not as fools, but as wise. And again, he uses this phrase, redeeming the time. And unlike Colossians about being towards them which are without, he says, because the days are evil. The days are evil. You recognize we live in a world that for now has temporary, uh, not Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He's the ruler of this present darkness, as, as it were, in the world. There are things that happen that, yes, they are humanly driven by their own sin and lusts and desires. But there's times that Satan intervenes and he gets involved and he pushes and prods people. And you, you sometimes wonder, is this worse than that? And there's a, there's a resistance to the things of God. There's a resistance to the gospel. There's a resistance to any th form of spirituality that draws someone closer to the Lord. And that resistance is a real thing. And part of why Paul says, redeem the time, is because the days are evil. We ought to make the most of our time because we don't know how much we have. But also because the days are evil. It was interesting in the last year, actually two years, um, when COVID first hit, we saw mass shortages of lots of things. You went to the grocery store and there was no toilet paper or there was no, you know, whatever went out. Or, or My wife went to get some canning items and that was just all gone. And when people heard the hint of there being shortages or things happening, they flocked to the stores to buy the things they thought they needed and they bought more than they thought they needed because they did not know how long this would be. This, in some ways, should be our approach to time. We should make the most of the, the day, the moment, the hour we have. We should do what we can to the best of God's glory every moment we have, because we don't know what's coming down the pike. Now, with COVID, the interesting thing is, like, now we have different shortages happening, and, you know, lumber has gone up and down. We can't always predict those things. I can't predict those things. You can't predict them. But we are to walk wisely. Now, I want to be careful here, because sometimes I've heard sermons on, like, redeeming the time and making the most of your time. And in such a way that the sermons preach to beat you over head that every time you take a break and every time you take a nap and every time you, you sleep in an extra hour, you do whatever, you're wasting time. There are times when I roll over and look at my clock and go, okay, it's four or five, six in the morning. I need to sleep till seven. I need to stay in bed, um, especially a while back when we had that snowstorm. Um, I don't, 
I don't remember all the details. My Fitbit said I got two hours of sleep that night. Okay, well, I know my body's going to need sleep. And I don't feel bad about spending time taking a nap the next day. God wants us to live as if our lives are for him. And if we're going to do that well, one, we're going to have to take time to do things that are necessity, like eating. We're going to have to take time to sleep, whether that's taking a nap or getting you know, so many hours of sleep per night, whatever it is. We need to take, we only have so much time and energy. It's a gift from God. But do we take what he's given us? Do we use it in an effective way possible? This is a bit of a, a shorter sermon this morning, but I think the point is, is clear and, and, and driven home, as it were. As we apply this, do you, do you focus on the time you have now? Or do you focus on seasons? Okay, When we think of seasons, sometimes we, we generalize things. As adults, we do this all the time. I think when things slow down, I'm going to... Sometimes they never slow down. That's part of life. Sometimes things don't slow down until something breaks. And so when you focus on, well, when this has happened, then I'll do this. No, you need to take what you have now. Do what you can with what you've got. You've got a day. You've got five minutes. You've got ten minutes. You've got this or that. Spend your time well, every moment God has given you is a moment that can and should be used well. And maybe using it well is taking a good nap. Okay? Maybe that's what you need. Maybe using it well is picking up the phone and calling somebody and saying, hey, I know you were having surgery or I know this was happening and, and how are you doing? Checking up. Maybe using it well is spending some time in prayer or doing some extra Bible reading. Whatever God calls you to, the Holy Spirit is not dead, folks. He likes to interact with us, and he likes to lead us, and he will lead us into what we should do moment by moment. Do you make the most of your time? The expression we use with money, and there's a lot of time expressions that get tied to money. You know, time is money. But the one I'm thinking of here is keep track of your pennies, and your dollars will take care of yourselves. You ever heard that? You keep track of your pennies, your dollars will take care of themselves. Anymore, a penny's not worth as much as it used to be. But the principle is you watch those little expenditures. You keep tabs on those things, and the dollars just keep adding up. And think about that in the realm of time. If you make the most of every moment, of every car ride, of every morning, of every, you know, whatever it is, you make the most of it. You, you offer it to the Lord and say, Lord, what can I do in this time that would please you? These are the tasks I have at hand. How, what, how can I best use this to please you? When you offer him the pennies, the moments, the seasons will take care of themselves. Let me encourage you this year. We're entering into a new year, uh, a year that we have no idea what it's going to bring, a year that may be a great year and may not be for you. We don't know. But what time you have, those individual moments, to everything there's a season. So make the most of each moment this year. Lord, we thank you for your word here this morning. Lord, we're thankful for the gift of time. You give us the time we need. And so often we find it easy to waste time and squander our time. But it is a gift from you something we ought to utilize in our lives. Lord, may we use our time and may we use this time to draw closer to you. May this year be a year of marked spiritual growth and transformation in our lives because we're taking those individual moments and we're using them in a way that honors and glorifies you. And Lord, at the end of this year, what may be a season May we look back and see the growth that you've made in our hearts and lives. With heads bowed and eyes closed as the piano begins to play. Let me ask you to be honest with yourself and with the Lord. Are you a good steward of your time? It's a gift God has given to you. 
but do we squander it? Do you sometimes use the excuse of, well, in this season or that season, I'll do this or that, but not right now? Looking at the big picture sometimes instead of doing what you can now. Have you squandered time and now you have to play catch up? Father, we thank you that you've given us the time that we have. And we're not guaranteed anymore, but we live in such a way, as Psalmist said, we should count our time or count our days, that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Lord, may we not squander the time you've given us. May we, with the time you've given us, touch others, drawing them to the Savior, encouraging them along their life walk and their path to draw closer to you. But may we also use that time to ourselves draw closer to you in sweetness and full communion. We ask this in your Son's name. Amen.